So who are we? There are masses of us. And if um, ESPER is about bringing together people who haven't worked together before, I think we get top marks there, because we have brought them together. Here were quite a lot of them in Sussex at our recent four consortium meeting, but they're meeting in lots of other ways. Some of the things to emphasise is we've got a huge range of, range of disciplines, from biology and anthropology through to veterinary science and medical science, through to, to macro modelling, through to environmental science. And we've also, I think quite unusually, got um, a mixture of university and research organisations and government departments. Um, in fact, as I'll show in a minute, each of our countries has um, two, at least two institutions, one which is a research organisation and one which is in the public sector doing policy, which is something we'll come back to when we talk about impact. But anyway, part of our inception phase has been about building relationships within this consortium, and I'll explain shortly how it's organised. But what are we doing and what's our problem and our context? Well, our context and our problematique relates to this observation by one of our consortium partners, Kate Jones, um, now at UCL, that globally, over the last few decades, more than 60% of emerging infectious diseases have been zoonotic. They've come from animals and they've been transmitted into people. Some of these, of course, have resulted in the kind of disease outbreak globally that's hit the headlines, whether it's um, avian flu or SARS. Um, but others, and those we're particularly concerned about, are more local, and they've been causing huge um, health and poverty impacts in the African settings that we're interested in. Um, but often in ways that are going underreported and therefore underaddressed, both in scientific and in policy terms. Now, we're seeing at the moment in, in the policy world, and indeed in the science world, um, much bigger interest in zoonotic diseases, and indeed what are being called one world, one health approaches, and variants of them, which are trying to link up ecosystem health, um, animal health, and human health, and looking at the interactions. But this, there's a great deal of talk about this. What there isn't is very much evidence of how these relationships actually work out on the ground and how one might go about understanding and managing them in ways that might benefit the poor. So that's what we're all about. So this is a list is what we're trying to aim at with this consortium project over the next few years. Um, our key aim is a practical one. It's about reducing the risks of disease emergence and their consequences for the poor by trying to manage ecosystems in ways that assist disease regulation Without, avoid, without having trade-offs in the other ways that people are using ecosystems. Now we're doing that largely through cutting edge new science of a new kind on the relationships between ecosystems, services and health and poverty. We see zoonotic disease as a really key focus for, for this, not just because of the poverty implications, but because of the, the scientific questions that we're able to ask. Um, and yet this both requires and is an opportunity to forward a new kind of scientific approach, which I'll, I'll, I'll talk about in the rest of the presentation, which is both interdisciplinary and needs, we suggest, to combine a variety of different kinds of modeling. So that's what our excellent science is aiming at. Now, we're focusing in on four diseases in five countries, hence our large array of partners. Um, and all these diseases do have significant poverty implications and impacts. Um, so, for instance, Lassa fever in Sierra Leone, transmitted by Mastomys rodents. It's a hemorrhagic fever with incredibly high fatality rates, big impacts on poor communities, especially vulnerable and pregnant women. Hennepa viruses in Ghana, transmitted from fruit bats, have caused fatal outbreaks in Asia. And, and our key scientific question is, are spillover events occurring in Africa, who are they affecting and how? Mosquito-borne Rift Valley fever in Kenya, and trypanosomiasis, sleeping sickness in Zambia and Zimbabwe, um, both affect livestock and people, therefore with poverty impacts both directly on human health, but also via the impacts on livestock that people depend on for incomes and livelihoods, um, with very large, yet often again formally underestimated um, impacts on farmers and herders who are but the reasons for these case studies are not just about their, their poverty implications, 
Um, it extends also to the ways in which they might provide exemplars of particular kinds of animal, human, environment transmission mechanisms, and ways in which, therefore, they might be compared to generate a bigger picture. So all of these diseases are ones that aren't yet transmitting human to human or human populations. They require this continued spillover process from animals to people to sustain infection. Our cases give us a variety of different ecosystem types to explore these relationships between ecosystem services and, and disease. From Ghana, where we're looking at humid forests, through to forest fringe areas in Sierra Leone, through to wooded savannas in Zambia and Zimbabwe, through to semi-arid areas in Kenya. We've got different spillover and transmission routes at work here, whether from rodents or bats, as it were, directly from wildlife, through to livestock being important as intermediate hosts, to insect vectors in the case of, of um, trips and Rift Valley fever, and then some interesting relationships between livestock and wildlife and the way wildlife may be buffering transmission from livestock, um, particularly in the trips case. And finally, they involve different sets of wider drivers, whether political and economic or social, um, operating in different cases. And these are all going to provide axes of comparison. In mm -hmm. So we've got an overall hypothesis um, driving the whole consortium, um, which we break down for the purposes of our, our science and case studies into some, some smaller and more, more manageable hypotheses. Um, but it's about the way that ecosystem services um, act to regulate disease in ways that are dynamic and changing. Um, this is really trying to pin down and provide some new science on this rather nebulous relationship that was highlighted in the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, that disease regulation is an ecosystem service. But actually, what does that really mean? How does it work? Quite a lot is published on the way biodiversity um, can operate through a sort of dilution effect, that where you've got more biodiversity, disease gets, as it were, spread amongst different animals, and as you lose biodiversity, it becomes concentrated, increasing the risk of disease. But this is actually rather simplistic, um, and what we're trying to do through a, a slightly more nuanced logic pathway is to work out some of the trade-offs, untangling the interactions here, and relate them to poverty and to unwell-being, um, and look at what forms these pathways might take in different case studies. Um, so each of our case studies is going to explore um, a range of questions, um, looking at how ecological changes, as shaped by the way people are using ecosystems, affect the dynamics of pathogens, hence the likelihood of the spillover, who becomes vulnerable to um, disease, by the ways that they interact with ecosystem services, how people move about in landscapes, interact with animals in the courses of their various livelihood activities. What are the impacts, therefore, um, of the disease on poverty and well-being? And what are some of the trade-offs? You can't simply think about the disease-regulating function of an ecosystem and therefore, for instance, keep people and wildlife apart, when actually people need to be in those ecosystems for other livelihood activities. So there are trade-offs at stake. Then we're interested in the wider drivers that are shaping those local interactions um, and their future implications. And then we're interested not just in looking at these things as it were in terms of objective material interactions, but also how different actors in the system understand them, whether it's local people, government, policy makers, um, international actors. How do they think about these things and how do they, their understanding shape the way they act. So this is adding a kind of reflexive dimension, um, which is a sort of political economy of knowledge, again one of the key as the themes. So this is how it all fits together um, with disease dynamics, ecosystem service and people in the middle, local systems shaped by wider drivers and some of this, these, these framings and understandings down the side. And each of these, the way we've sought to organise holding this rather, rather complicated set of questions together is to identify each of these capitalised bits as a cross-cutting theme which will be explored across each of our cases so that we end up with a, 
a kind of model for doing this science and delivering on it, which looks a bit like this. Um, across the top, we have these cross-cutting themes together with the leads on them. Um, so different institutions and people bringing different disciplinary and, and sort of approach expertise leading on each of the themes. Um, each applying particular sorts of research approaches. This is not at the level of methods, it's the level, at the level of approaches. And key to this is that we're thinking about modeling and trying to develop a suite of models which we will in the end draw, draw together. So our themes are linked to these different kinds of modeling, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. Disease ecosystem dynamics linked to some process-based mathematical modeling. Our wider drivers theme linked to empirical modeling and mapping of those drivers. Our local systems theme around human interactions linked to participatory modeling approaches. Um, and then cross-cutting themes around valuation and around narratives and um, political economies of knowledge. What we will be doing is in integrating each of these within each case so that we generate a kind of holistic picture for each case study. But we will also be integrating um, across the cases and across the themes towards ending up with a kind of multi-scale systems analysis which can enable us to say something bigger and more significant about this, this bigger problematic of disease regulation and disease more generally. And we're taking this integration challenge, which is not small, very seriously, and it's something we talked about a great deal at our consortium workshop. Um, Victor Galaz from the Stockholm Resilience Centre is convening it, um, drawing in approaches to systems analysis, and we've got a series of meetings which will enable us to, to take that forward. The first of which began in June at our full consortium workshop which consolidated these plans um, and laid the ground for a series of further small group meetings which will happen on site in countries and in different places, and those are now ongoing. And they'll be really central uh, to holding this whole show on the road. So I'm going to hand over now to James, who is going to go through the next bit and talk in a bit more detail about the country cases and the modeling, some of the modeling approaches. In terms of the approach that we're taking, um, this is giving you the, 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 the overview of the whole, um, um, of the consortium as a whole. We're starting off with some um, very clear um, situation analyses um, on, a, on a disease by disease and country by country basis. Um, and there's a real overlap in terms of approach. I mean, obviously, the emphases and drivers um, of all the different diseases have, have a very different slant, whether you're talking about uh, some of the forest systems in Syria, the only three to um, the, the, the more arid um, ecosystems in Kenya where we're studying Rift Valley fever. Um, but starting with the obviously this focus um, on relationships between disease um, and uh, the ecology and poverty, um, a real review of the existing knowledge that we have in each of the, uh, of the, uh, of the case countries um, in relation to um, the drivers and the um, and our understanding of the disease diagnosis, which are, um, in many cases a, there's a massive underdiagnosis, but in fact, pretty much all cases, a massive central underdiagnosis of disease, even if there's more local awareness of it. Um, and a key um, output or outcome from the, the, the culture studies is, is um, working up what the uh, case studies, um, research, and field work plans are going to Make sure, very importantly, that these are integrated um, with the cross cutting modeling themes which are going to rely to a massive extent on the data coming from, um, from the, uh, the, the perhaps more vertically driven country, country work. Um, and, and this is uh, challenging, but uh, being surprisingly effective in terms of the way that it's um, integrating um, between uh, the, the, the country themes and the cross-cutting uh, cross models. And actually those personal relationships that were started at the, the, the consortium um, kickoff meeting a few months ago were really critical to make that, that happen. So what are we actually doing um, or thinking about in each of the, each of the uh, different uh, case studies? So Kenya, where there's a focus on Rift Valley fever um, and thinking um, up in the more arid uh, northeast or eastern parts of um, Kenya, 
and the key underexplored area for Rift Valley fever is the, um, the impact of irrigation. And so we have a, two comparative sites um, comparing irrigated and non-irrigated areas um, with a real um, focus on trying to, trying to explore further the ecology and so, socioeconomics of Rift Valley fever, which is far, far too often just seen as a, an animal disease with occasional spillover into humans and some of the larger, larger epidemics, um, which as Melissa says, this is a direct, uh, an insect transmitted, um, particularly mosquito transmitted infection, but during big epidemics, um, the animal, direct animal interface can be very important with livestock owners themselves picking up the infection directly from their animals in a way that's poorly, poorly characterized. And certainly, um, there's a major part of the impact of this disease on a human basis. Then trypanosomiasis, which we're studying in, um, in different ecosystems in, in Zambia and Zimbabwe, a real focus here on the, um, the, the socioeconomic and ecological um, degradation that's going on here. And this is a very complex disease in relation um, to, to its uh, dynamic drivers with a, um, interactions between wildlife and domestic animals being particularly important. And often where there's a, there is an interface, that's where you see some of the worst uh, human and um, poverty impacts of, of this disease in ways that are really very poorly characterized. And, so much of the work over the last 20 or 30 years is focused on uh, the setse uh, fly um, vector and the, and the ecological drivers of, of its distribution and, um, and how they can, they can be influenced and controlled. And there's been very little emphasis um, for this disease um, on, on the actual disease in humans, um, which, which is um, it's a, classic, a real classic example of a neglected tropical disease in the way that it's been, been studied um, in the modern world. Uh, modern medical uh, research here. Um, fruit bats are widespread across all of sub-Saharan Africa um, and there's now very clear evidence that they are the, um, the reservoir species for uh, henopoviruses and paramyxoviruses that cause, um, uh, cause major disease outbreaks um, and uh, important endemic foci in parts of, of Asia and uh, Southeast Asia and also Austra Australia. Um, where there's both direct and through uh, transmission um, through domestic animals to human keepers. Um, these fruit bats are also very important reservoirs of, of other um, RNA viruses in sub-Saharan Africa, and you'll all be aware of the Ebola outbreaks that are going on in Central Africa and Uganda at the moment. Um, within Ghana, um, we have a, a, a contrast between trying to understand um, the so, uh, social and um, environmental drivers of possible disease transmission can vary in an urban site where one of the largest roosts of these fruit bats um, is in the middle of the capital city of Kral. And we're comparing that to a, a, another roost that's even larger, so of several million, um, in a very, uh, very rural uh, area in, uh, in central, um, in central um, Ghana, north of Kumasi. Um, the ecological and poverty relationships of the spillover of viruses from bats are really hardly characterised whatsoever. Um, and, uh, and I think that, particularly with growing land use change across West Africa and other parts of the continent, um, how uh, that impacts on human bat interactions and likelihood of spillover and hence impact of the disease are very important underexplored questions. As Melissa said, that Lassa fever is, a, is an infection that, that's held in a, a very common um, rat that lives both around the home and also in, um, in, in, in agricultural uh, communities um, out in the fields. And the virus, which is excreted in rat urine, um, is found in a, a widespread way in, in these rodents. Um, there's actually very little information, despite the kind of medical scare um, that uh, the, the term Lassa fever holds. There's very little information at all on the um, social and ecological dynamics of this disease um, and how uh, poverty itself can impact on the likelihood of spillover. Um, where you keep your food and, and whether it's in rodent-proof storage, where you have the facility to, to develop that sort of system is um, completely under um, underexplored um, across the whole of the Lassa Belt, which, which extends across a lot of West Africa, and certainly into Nigeria and um, into Cameroon. Um, and so the, this disease certainly has an impact um, on poverty, but we, what's underexplored is the impact of poverty on the risk of transmission. So the approach that we're taking with, with, with the, 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 uh, a lot of the, 
um, the, the two first modeling um, strands is a very clear quantitative approach um, looking uh, at, at infection dynamic models or more um, associative models, uh, correlative models of the, on the ecological area, and certainly developing ways that these can be um, closely integrated. And we we'll already have a, a number of uh, studies ongoing integrating um, the, the um, ecological driver approach with um, the epidemic dynamic type modeling um, system whatsoever. But the key questions that we're trying to address within these, the, these modeling frameworks is looking at um, evidence for bio, biodiversity and personal disease, um, thinking about um, with our modeling approach uh, whether we can use the expected number of some of these um, spillover events which occur over time as Melissa described um, and relate them to, to different uh, environmental and uh, social uh, conditions and I'm trying to understand far more the, uh, the details of, of, um, of the interactions between humans, wildlife um, and their diseases that, that, that are infecting Multi-scale modeling, um, multi-scale spatial modeling is, is, is looking very much at uh, these, uh, these uh, spatial drivers of disease which operate at very, um, both very uh, wide scales but also um, for, for some of these spillover events at very, um, very small scale. Um, this is taking far more of a pattern-based um, based approach um, and, and, and as I said it, also integrates very clearly with the with mathematical modeling approaches that, that we're going to be taking. And just as an example here, there's a, a marked variation in the, in the amount of Lassa fever that's observed both, both in the host, um, the rat host, but also in terms of spillover into humans. And using um, data that are already available, we can start trying to map, um, map the likelihood of Lassa fever um, spillover events occurring um, based on the ecological um, and clinical data that are already um, already available. Um, and at that stage, I'm going to hand over to Catherine. Okay, so for the participation modelling, we're going to draw together ethnographic and qualitative social research techniques with a range of participatory appraisal and participatory epidemiological methods. Um, an example of this would be matrix ranking and scoring, which will enable us to collect both qualitative and quantitative data. And we will also look at social differences such as gender and wealth status. Um, these will enable us to understand livelihood systems and practices, as well as people's knowledge and experience of disease and risk, ecosystem change, and the framings of the case study disease in relation to other health challenges. Okay. <laughs> um, interacting with these modelling approaches that we've described are two further themes. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about is the socio-economic and environmental values. And this is building a basic conceptual framework that helps to explain the types and values and trade-offs being targeted within the drivers of disease programme. This approach that we're using will deepen the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity framework to address the identification and valuation of different ecosystem services and perceptions of these relevant types of changes and perceived benefits and losses associated with this, as well as the winners and losers in local communities. Um, the other theme I'm going to talk about today is the political economic economy of knowledge and policy. Identification of narratives and national re and regional policy actors and other stakeholders concerning disease, environmental and poverty linkages and control and associated political economic interests. And during this process, we will explore how narratives interact with the policy processes. I'm also going to talk a little bit about the data collection methods that we're going to use. Um, we're using a wide range of methods, some of which are described here. Um, these are not matched by theme or modeling type. Um, the models will draw together data collected from a variety of different approaches. And for us, this will involve careful planning and visits by the multidisciplinary in-country teams, as well as visits by UK-based modellers and joint interaction in the field among the different groups. Um, we're beginning to, to work this out at the moment. So I'm also going to talk a little bit about when we're doing this work in the field, how we're going to do data storage. And several of our colleagues have been working on a system that the whole project can use that will enable us to, to, to get access to the data and to be able to store it in a, in a very manageable way. And they've come up with a, some, they've decided that we should use something called EpiCollect, which is a mobile application. And it can collect data including GPS position and photos. And this data can be collected 
on a project website or on your phone and downloaded and viewed um, on a mobile phone. This has many advantages for us as a project. It's a free program to use. It can be used as an Android application. It, it's, it's very um, very cheap to use and very simple to use as well. And we had a demonstration at our June workshop um, with all of our partner organisations involved and it seemed like something that everybody was on board with and felt able to use. Um, I'm just going to give a quick example of how we could use it. So if a sample was collected in the field, it can be linked to background data via a QR code, which is then automatically uploaded to target servers as geolocated data, and then already grouped by predefined factors. So you can kind of see, see how this would be laid out here. And I'll just end my little bit of the talk with my hand back with the timeline of, of how the project is going at the moment. So we're currently in the inception phase, and we've recruited the core members of the team, as well as the subcontracting arrangements with partner organisations. We had our first consortium workshop at the Institute of Development Studies in June. Um, the situation analyses are due at the end of this month, and we are in the development of modelling plans with the case study data and collection plans. Um, then we're moving on to the field research and modelling phase, um, and come with a June workshop at Ilri in Kenya. And the final part of the project is broader engagement with scientific and policy communities, including in-country workshops and an international conference in Cambridge. And I'll just hand over to Melissa, so thank you very much. Okay, so um, what do we expect to achieve? We're focusing here on the, the scientific outcomes, the academic impacts. Um, and the first will be, actually, what we hope will be a new sort of conceptualisation theory, really, about these relationships between ecosystem services, disease regulation, as I think has become clear, not very well understood. We want to be able to say something quite big and quite new at a theoretical level. We'll also be producing a ton of evidence base, of evidence, um, evidence around these interactions for some of these diseases in key case study settings. Um, we'll be producing a series of models which will emerge in particular articles, particular publications and so on. Um, at different scales and some outputs which will integrate those models. And drawing some of those together into a, a broader systems analysis which should provide a way in to identify trade-offs, the effects of interventions, tipping points perhaps in where at a particular moment of biodiversity loss then triggers an accelerated set of spillages and so on. So this is where the, the broader integration will lead to, to scientific outputs. Um, We'll be producing evidence and understanding around drivers, around these broader drivers, how these local ecosystem interactions are shaped by some of these big changes, population change, urbanisation, um, climate change and so on, which will be, through our integration work, feeding into to prognostic kinds of scenarios which could be used in policy making. We'll be looking at um, generating understanding around policy processes and the roles of different kinds of not stakeholder knowledge and narratives in them. And then finally, I don't think it should be under, underestimated. Um, I think a consortium like this inevitably will pioneer new practices around interdisciplinary and research, government, practitioner, collaboration and capacity. And we actually started this off as something we're tracking through the consortium. Um, at our June workshop, we started a sort of blog series for participants to reflect as we go through on what they're learning from each other, on what some of the not insignificant challenges are, as well as the, the benefits of the numerous interactions that we're having in workshop settings and very shortly in field settings too. And finally, um, as we'll be emphasizing in our presentation tomorrow, we're not just about academic outputs, we're very much geared towards practical and policy impacts, which will, I think, also shape the kinds of outputs, the kinds of publications, and the kinds of interactions we will be having in country from the very beginning. Um, what we're aiming at is the kinds of evidence, the kinds of understandings which can enable ecosystem services to be managed better in more sustainable ways that reduce disease risks and burdens for the poor. Whether it's through practical techniques like some of these, whether it's through more joined up, integrated ways of thinking about health and environmental policy, whether it's new approaches to surveillance, which are about survey surveying system interactions, not just disease outcomes, or whether it's about new institutional arrangements to try and think about things in a more holistic way. So 
but we'll say much more about that soon tomorrow. What was the basis of your selection of the, the diseases you decided to study? Well, it was um, it was a combination of the factors we were talking about, contrasting ecosystem types, um, contrasting places. Um, a focus on zoonotic diseases which require human-animal interaction to, to generate human yeah. impacts, as it were. Um, and then we wanted an African focus. These are all important. And then there was a question about partnerships. I think a, a project of this kind is always driven partly by um, the interests of those who were, were, were who were coming on board. So we, we already had some. I mean, the, the, our PPD grant was a very useful opportunity to explore institutions and partnerships where there were people who were not just interested in this broader problematic, but were interested in approaching it in a in, in this kind of rather novel interdisciplinary. So, as it were, a willingness to be quite open, to be quite experimental. Just to follow up on the comment about Liz's comment about partnerships, one of the things which is difficult for particularly for funders um, is to understand who's involved in, in the projects. And you have that slide up which had your list of, of partners. It would be really useful to have all to have that for all of the projects. And we'll actually come to you later on this year yeah. to get that updated. Because you know how bad one might have bad. You know the information which comes in the program documents, it's designed for a specific reason, which is to fund. Okay? And when it comes to this about understanding mm -hmm. who's working, we'll come back to it and say, who, who are you working with? And give us updates as we go on, because the this partnership component is absolutely crucial, as, as you need to demonstrate. So and I think it's it's worked as well, because when I came into this thinking that some um, it was insane and can possibly work with this <laughs> number of different um, Institutions. Actually, the workshop that we've got and, and the follow-up since then has demonstrated that that with the right people, with the right mindset, yeah. actually you can make these things done better. But I think this is where the the human elements, the choice, are are actually really important in terms yeah. of making yeah. this consortium work. Yeah. Uh, two questions. <coughs> Thinking in terms of um, the sharing expertise, etc. I mean, two things particularly grab me. First is this the QR code. System. Yeah. I quite like to hear a little yeah. bit more about that. Yeah. And, 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 and finally, the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the issue you mentioned at the end in terms of almost uh, a narrative on the experience yeah. of doing interdisciplinary yeah. narrative yeah. is something obviously that ESPER as a programme yeah. could capture in a bigger context. I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit more. You know, uh, we've, we've, we write blogs, but how you translate that into something a bit more exactly. of an exercise. I mean, the, the EpiCollect system, we're actually really excited about, and I do think this could be a resource potentially of interest to, to, to other projects. Um, I mean, this is being led by our, our UCL partners, by Dave Redding and Kate Jones, who, who already use this and have offered to, as it were, roll this out and, and guide its use, set it up and guide its use for the consortium. And I'm no expert on it. I don't think any of us have ever used it directly, but it sounds great and just a few and very, very flexible. So we are very prepared, it might be something I'll talk to Paul and others about to... to I was going to suggest, um, how about starting off with a short article in one of the forthcoming newsletters to share with the community? Possibly, possibly, <laughs> possibly could, or maybe kind of set up almost a sort of mini project to, to, to share it. Exactly. We could talk about well, how, I how think that works. It can work very well in some yeah. formats, but there's more development work. Yeah. There's more understanding that's needed about the opportunities here. And I think, and exactly. I think that this so, is, yeah. Yeah, they, they're these broad-ranging things you can make look very nice, and they can work very well, yeah. but there, there is more work needed to, to really deliver. Yeah. And one doesn't want a tool, a data collect, a data storage tool driving one's field work. Mm -hmm. that's, it, no, it's, 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 in the end, it should be the other way around. So the idea is what this seems to offer is a very flexible approach for logging in data and doing all the things mm -hmm. that are so difficult to do when you're struggling with a laptop in a place with electricity and so on. So that should help. The interdisciplinarity, the kind of reflective diaries, is something we hope will work. I mean, it'll rely on people contributing and being prepared to write some of it down rather than just this becoming the, the, the in the Land Rover conversation or the, the stuff you sort of chat about in private. But we've already got some nice reflections about our initial workshop and our kind of like schizophrenic discussions about modelling and so on. Um, and we would like to, to write about this. <laughs> Wide range. Um, wide range. <laughs> but it would be great. I mean, we would like to, to eventually have this as something that we would produce some joint, joint
joint articles about um, mm. science, technology, and human values, or social science journalism. <coughs> But it's, but a, it's a journey. Yeah. It's, it's, I a, think journey. it's yeah. a journey. It's not a. It's not a. It's not a. It's not a clear no. outcome. Yeah. 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 Well, these are just ideas. I'm not an expert on diseases. So you had a question saying how biodiversity affects <coughs> disease. Yeah. So I, I will also suggest her to think about how the use that you make of biodiversity yeah. impacts disease. I think that's another way of thinking that question. Impacts disease. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and absolutely, I mean, that is actually in, embedded in our second question, okay. is really about how different people, different social groups, move about in the landscape in the course of making use of all kinds of aspects of biodiversity, as services for livelihoods, collective food, and fiber, hunting, and medicine, and doing farming, and so on, mm -hmm. and how that brings people into situations where they might be at, at, at risk of, of disease because they're in places where the animals that are harboring them have. That's central. That's absolutely at the heart of our, oh, of our local yeah. work. We'll be untangling those, yeah. those okay. relationships. Yeah. And then I work, and the team I work with at SIA, we're leading the, the global program on climate change. Yeah. So I saw a very interesting thing in terms of the mosquito, the disease transmitted by mosquitoes, and you yeah. said you were comparing. Um, irrigated versus not irrigated. I was just thinking about the trade-offs that you can have in the future in Africa when you're thinking about adaptation for communities that are going to be facing droughts and how certain interventions for agricultural livestock are going to have trade-offs in terms of diseases. So I think that's a very interesting thing to think about. I just want to raise that. I think that they're critically important and actually quite well described in for some diseases in Africa already. I mean, schistosomiasis is one of the best examples where widespread irrigation has resulted in massive spread of the snail that um, is intermediate host for this important human, human parasite and resulted in far wider um, impact of disease than previously was the case. So I mean, it, it's, that, that, that's it's very well described. Right? Because it's good security and, and disease and, yeah. and, and, and but, a, but the poverty relationships aren't for, for that particular disease and probably and certainly not for Rift either are not described. So, so, yes, there's more food security, but the people who are um, at the bottom, uh, uh, there's the, the, the far greater impact of that disease on the poor who can't avoid the water contact. And they're and not so, necessarily benefited from Exactly, yeah. exactly. But I think that's right, and, and part of the aim of our approach is actually to join up some of these strands of thinking, because often you have a, 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 a scientific community that's looking at climate change and food and irrigation and adaptation and so on, and a wholly different scientific community that's looking at the spread of disease under climate change. And it's beginning to bring these together as research communities and then as related policy communities that we really hope that we can, can do. That would be my final question. Mm -hmm. is you've got your four case studies. Mm -hmm. How, you know, now you're, you're getting more into the operation. Yeah. Are you starting to see that you'll get this potential to get this lesson learning between the uh, to train them across the four case studies and get something else which is sort of generic lessons. I, I think yeah. that's, that, that's going to come oh, first yeah. from the, from the cross-cutting themes. And yeah. I think yeah. that, um, that the, the nature of that work is that, that those themes need to be applied in the different case studies. And mm -hmm. I think it, it's only going to come yeah. well, once we, we have overlapping with the people that are working across the different mm -hmm. case studies that we're really going to see the, um, the added value come through there. But I mean, I'm sure it will come. But I quite well in how and what it will be, I think, will be the really but interesting thing because it's unpredictable. But that's exactly what we want for these projects. These projects we are not expecting every project to give us the expected outcome. No. No. I'd be quite happy to get some unexpected outcomes, yeah. which are evidence based, yeah. as you pointed yeah. out. Yeah. But I think one of the, the processes are key in that, and I mean, we've already got ongoing physical meetings in the UK, in the field, and, and we've been grabbing opportunities around the world for the cross-cutting team leaders and the modelers to meet with the country teams. Correct. And so there's this ongoing iterative process, and it'll involve field interaction, it'll involve field leaders and modelers visiting different cases. Yeah. And I think there'll be a lot of serendipity. I think those interactions will generate surprises, and people will say, ah, oh, but in Kenya it's like this, and now here in Sierra Leone it's like this, and I think we'll get all sorts of those things emerging. But as Jen says, it's a bit unpredictable at this point. Yeah. 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 Yeah.